story today is connected to this wooden plaque which sits on the side of a shed in the churchyard at Polstead in the county of Suffolk. And it's commemorating the death and burial of Mariah Martin, who was buried nearby from this spot, having been murdered in the Red Barn in Polstead itself. And the story has all the elements that one would expect to find from a good Bronte novel, which is quite interesting, of course, because the Brontes were active during the period that this crime had been committed, and no doubt their imaginations could have been fired by the events which took place here, which, if you believe, involves an alleged wicked squire and a poor innocent maiden who fell into his evil clutches. Or is it? Mariah Martin was born here in Polstead in the year 1801. She was the eldest of four children. Her father Thomas was the local mole catcher and her mother was named Grace. Unfortunately, despite being quite a respectable occupation during that period, mole catching did not exactly provide enough food and comfort for a growing family of four children and two adults. And so sadly, by the age of seven, she was placed into the domestic service care of the nearby vicar at Laham, where she earned her keep by generally keeping the house clean and tidy and probably working in the kitchen. It was there that, fortunately for her, that the vicar was kind enough to teach her to read and write, which at that time of history was a great social skill that unfortunately was lacking in many of the local population who were largely ignorant and unread. She also acquired a taste for fine clothing and a better way of life. Living inside the vicarage was a far cry from the home which she left behind, which at that period of history must have been something almost akin to a hovel, and that's how unfortunately most poor people lived. Sadly for her, when she was nine and working for the vicar, her mother Grace had died at home, but she continued working at the vicarage until her teenage years, where eventually the vicar dismissed her for her levity and her fondness for fine clothes certainly it made a mark upon the young Mariah and she wanted to do everything in her power to turn her life around to make it better for her. And so reluctantly she returned back to the family home where she continued for a while to look after the three younger charges until of course a few years later when Thomas Martin eventually remarried a woman by the name of Anne who was barely a few years older than Mariah and was also just as pretty by all accounts. And for Mariah, the home life wasn't for her. She wanted to improve herself within society, and the only way that she could see how she could break that glass ceiling would be to snare a wealthy young man who would be able to provide the kind of luxuries for which she was certainly becoming accustomed to. And the first man that she met and embarked upon an affair with was no less than Thomas Calder, who was the brother of William Calder, who will feature very shortly. She bore him an illegitimate child. And of course, Thomas, realizing at that time, and one has to take into consideration attitudes for this period of history, regarded her as far below his station. And fortunately for him, and perhaps for her, the child soon died afterwards, and he moved on to other conquests, leaving Mariah then to snag a man by the name of Peter Matthews, who was connected with nearby Polstead Hall, which sits to the side here at Polstead Church, and embarked upon an affair with him. And from their relationship, she had a child, who was baptised Thomas Henry, who in fact was the only survivor of all the children that she gave illegitimate birth to. Peter Matthews was a man who stood up to his responsibilities. Whilst he certainly didn't want to marry her, and one can only assume the social divide or class divide came into play here, he certainly made sure that she was provided for to look after the child, 
and paid her regular checks, I believe of the sum of £5, to ensure the upkeep of his illegitimate child. One can imagine, of course, that Anne, her stepmother, was probably saddled with the responsibility of looking after that child as well. But I digress, because then she moved on to another young man, a local squire by the name of William Calder, who was Thomas Calder's brother, and perhaps was the black sheep of the family. How they met, allegedly, was that one afternoon he was walking past the cottage, he espied Maria working in the cottage garden. Um, they both exchanged smiles, she gave him a curtsy, and from that moment onwards, the inevitable conclusion of this act led to their affair together. But a little bit more firstly about William Calder himself. William Calder, the other player in this terrible saga, was born either in 1803 or 1804, depending on which account that you read. But one thing is for certain, he had an elder brother by the name of Thomas, his father was named John, he had a second eldest brother by the name of John, and him being third in line was followed by the youngest by the name of James. Certainly, as far as his father was concerned, he had a dislike for William, and so William, throughout his adolescent years, was much more closer to his mother than to any other member of his family. At school, he was nicknamed Foxy because he was a very sly and very deceptive and dishonest person. He would lie to people and he would keep information to himself. Nobody in his class group trusted him. At the age of 16, William Calder was brought back to work on the farm by his father. And certainly I can imagine that William Calder wasn't the person who felt he was cut out for a farming life, and especially when he was being paid a pittance of a wage as a farm labourer. But regardless, it was then that he had his first sexual conquest with a young lady who was engaged as a farm worker, working on picking peas. And it is said that after consummating the sexual act between him and her, he awarded her a mass of vegetables to take back to her own family. Because of the pittance of a wage that was being paid by his father, William Calder was obviously cash strapped because he liked to spend whatever social time he had drinking at the cock inn in the village of Polstead on the Green and of course socialising with the young ladies from the village and that required cash so he wasn't adverse to actually stealing from his father. On one occasion he stole his father's pigs and sold them to the man by the name of Balaam as a result of which his father was forced to repay the money back to Balaam in order to get his pigs back. He also stole a cheque, I believe, for £97, but all this in the quarter's mind was for a purpose, to provide for himself and his social life, which to him was far more important than the day-to-day -day runnings of a very busy farm. By this time, of course, his father had enough of William Calder and decided that he was to join the Merchant Navy and sent him off to London to sign up to become a young officer on board a ship, presumably going anywhere as long as it was far enough away from the village of Polstead and not to interfere with his father's day-to-day -day life routines. Fortunately, perhaps for him, he failed his eyesight test on a number of possible appointments and interviews and was turned down as a potential naval recruit. As a result of which, he started to indulge more in the nightlife of London, which he greatly enjoyed in the drinking and gambling dens and meeting all kinds of weird and wonderful people that are naturally attracted like moths to the light to these kind of places. It was during this time that he first caught sight of an alluring beauty by the name of Hannah Fandango, if you can believe that that was her surname allegedly the daughter of a ship's captain and her mother apparently was a Creole Indian which gave her a beautiful rich complexion and made her dark and mysterious which in this period of history was certainly something very attractive to a lot of young people around London at that time. Hannah had actually left a girls school where she was boarding at the age of 14 and had turned onto the London streets as a prostitute. Through this, she made a number of wealthy acquaintances, 
but she was soon spurned by them because of her licentious behaviour. She could not be trusted and she was an embarrassment. And as a result of which, she went back onto the streets as a common prostitute and also smuggling. And from that she was able to make, if it can be called that, a successful career at this particular form of crime. And during that period, he also made the acquaintances of two other people. One was a master poisoner and forger, a man by the name of Thomas Griffiths Wainwright, and a dark and shady character of low repute, a man by the name of Samuel Beauty Smith. Calder and Fandango entered into a very close and very committed sexual relationship. But like Fandango's previous dealings with other people, they were always short-lived and mostly amounted to how much cash they had in their pocket. And so Corda and Hannah Fandango were soon to part as lovers. But he did acquire a number of certain skills, such as card sharking, fraud and deception, which he put to good effect. But of course, in the long term, it wasn't enough to sustain his stay in London. And so reluctantly for him, he was forced to return back to the Calder farm. In April 1824, William Calder was back working on the farm. Having taken and eaten humble pie from his father, he was placed back on a peasant's wage as a labourer. He swore to attend church regularly and to work long hours and spend little time drinking or whoring from the cocking public house. And this seemed to work for at least two years, and perhaps at that moment of history, the family breathed a sigh of relief that he had finally mended his ways. But of course, this was all a temporary stay because William Calder was simply biding his time. Fortunately for William, in December of 1825, his father John finally expired from this world and his two other brothers being invalided by tuberculosis, which was a persistent and common problem at that time of history, leaving the elder brother, Thomas, to run the farm. And in that regard, William was a willing lieutenant. But of course, like everything, this was not to last for much longer. And that change occurred in the year 1826, when he finally met Mariah Martin. William, of course, was still socially aware of what his peers would say if he was caught having an affair with a common working girl, such as Mariah Martin, which would have been completely and utterly unacceptable to the social classes of that time. Very soon, both used to meet secretly at an old barn known as the Red Barn, which was situated one mile to the east of Mariah's cottage. It was a fairly safe bet to meet there. The barn was regarded as haunted and certainly nobody went there late at night. And so they had moments of intimacy together in the straw of the barn, where in September of that year, she finally announced to William that she was pregnant. And you can imagine that this would have set a cold chill down his spine because now he was faced with a responsibility one that he could not easily walk away from due to the fact that despite their secret liaisons there were wagging tongues. Certainly by Christmas of that year cracks were starting to form in the relationship between William Corder and Mariah Martin and that came to effect in the theft and encashment of a five pound cheque given to her by Peter Matthews as maintenance support for the young son. At first, William Calder utterly denied it. And it was only because of Peter Matthews employing a solicitor to actually trace through the system to where the cheque went that he was finally forced to admit his guilt. And of course, from that moment onwards, Mariah knew that she had a hook onto William Calder because during the Regency period, if you were found guilty of theft or fraud, you would either be executed or sent for a number of years to a penal colony in Australia, none of which appealed, of course, to William Calder. And so at that moment, 
he was forced to eat humble pie with Mariah and, of course, to keep her on board in order for him to avoid any possible discomfort which may arise as a result of their relationship together. Sadly, by February the 23rd of the following year, further tragedy struck the Corder household. Thomas Corder actually drowned while taking a shortcut across the village pond to the house and had fallen through the ice and had died in the cold and freezing water. And, of course, his two other brothers were still invalided by TB and so he had control over the family farm and business which must have been much to the shock and dismay of his mother, who was completely beside herself with grief. With regard to William's relationship with Mariah, their liaisons became so frequent that everybody knew about what was going on between them. And so one can imagine that for a period of time, people were talking openly and perhaps behind his back whenever he made their acquaintance over his indulgences with this woman from a much lower social order of that period. But one thing the village gossips didn't know was the fact that William Calder had already admitted to Thomas Martin and his wife Anne that he in fact was the father of her unborn child. He also claimed that he would provide for the child but he would never give any commitment to actually marrying her. On the 19th of March, in order for her to have her birth in secret, he took her to a rented property in Plough Lane, Sudbury, where she remained until she gave birth to a young boy in April. The child had returned back to Polstead and was placed in the charge of Anne, who was responsible not just for her baby, but also the child from her previous relationship. Sadly, of course, at that time, both mother and child were quite ill. And sadly, a few weeks later, the baby died, although Mariah made a full recovery. Following the death of the baby, Calder at no point wanted to be associated with himself and Mariah and the baby, even though it was now in spirit. And so they both agreed to secrete the burial of the baby's body somewhere in the Polstead district. And to this day, nobody knows exactly where the baby's body was buried. To add further intrigue to the whole matter, and perhaps to pour oil on troubled waters, Hannah Fandango and Samuel Beauty Smith made a surprise appearance in the village of Polstead. Hannah Fandango, in fact, had rented a cottage nearby and was using it for illicit smuggling activities. This created a great deal of worry for the Martin household. Their daughter had already gone through a pregnancy which sadly resulted in a death with William Calder and they needed more commitment from him with regard to his future upkeep and relationship with their daughter. And so under pressure Calder agreed to marry her in mid-May. And that, of course, in Corder's mind, had created further problems with how to extricate himself from what could have been and promised to be a terribly, terribly troubling situation for him. And so he concocted a story which he thought would resolve all of the issues with regard to the Martin household and the alleged embarrassment that the whole situation would cause to the Corder household. And so the story that he gave Mariah was that the local parish constable, a man by the name of John Balaam, had in fact a warrant for her arrest for having illegitimate children, which, believe it or not, was actually a criminal offence in that period of history. Part of William's scheme was to assure the Martins that the matter could be quickly resolved by removing Mariah from the village and taking her to Ipswich, where he claimed that he would marry her but they had to act with due haste because the parish constable could arrive at the house at any moment. And so what he did, he instructed her to dress as a man and make her way independently up to the Red Barn where he would be waiting for her with a pony and gig and also her luggage, which she would obviously use when they travelled to Ipswich. 
And so later in that day, she was seen to leave the cottage for the last time, and the last time that she was ever seen again by any living soul, dressed as a man and making her way mournfully to what would be her last meeting with William Corder at the Red Barn. Later, William returned from the Red Barn on his own, and from that moment onwards, he became very deceptive and quite evasive to questions about where Mariah was, was she fine, was she okay, have you married her, etc., etc. The excuse that he gave at this time was that she was in the care of Miss Rowland in Great Yarmouth, and that it was his intention to meet up with her and to marry. He claimed to the family that he could not return her sooner to the village for fear of provoking the villagers in this matter, and that perhaps if she stayed away from the village of Polstead, matters would eventually die down and she would be allowed to return. And finally, further tragedy struck the Calder household in the summer of that year when both Calder's surviving brothers died from TB, leaving him as sole heir to the family estate. But the issue of the disappearance of Mariah would constantly dock him throughout this period. Running out of excuses for her disappearance, he eventually told the family that by Michael Mass in the year 1827, both he and Mariah would finally be wed. But by the 8th of September of that year, things had become far too hot under the collar for him, and so he decided that he needed an excuse to get away from Polstead and possible retribution. And so he told the villagers that he was going away for a few weeks to recuperate from ill health and would make a return later. Thomas Martin seemed assured by that excuse. After all, he was a young gentleman and surely his word was his bond. Sadly, as he was to discover later, that was as far from the truth as anything could possibly be. Anne Martin, however, was having nothing of it. She suspected something terrible had happened to her stepdaughter and persisted in trying to find out fresh and further information. Calder had to react quickly to that, and so he wrote a letter on the 18th of October of that year addressed to the Martins to say that he was in London, staying at the Ball Hotel in Leadenhall Street, and that he planned to marry her on the Isle of Wight, where he was going to buy a farm in order for them to be together as a farming couple. He also claimed in his letter that they were in fact now man and wife, although of course in this letter he offered absolutely no proof to this particular union under law. And of course the one nagging fault in the Martins' minds at this time was that they had actually received at no point any communication whatsoever from Mariah, and everything existed entirely upon the word of William Calder. William had absolutely no intentions of buying a farm on the Isle of Wight, nor indeed of living on the Isle of Wight. Instead, he decided that he would advertise for a wealthy bride. He knew that had he returned to Polstead, all those nagging questions concerning the disappearance of Mariah may certainly have caught up with him. And so he placed adverts in the Times of London newspaper and also others advertising for the right lady. In fact, he received over 100 replies, and one of those was an extremely attractive young lady by the name of Mary Moore, who had the added bonus of being quite wealthy. And so, after a short courtship, in November of 1827, they married and bought a property together, a rather spacious house in Ealing, West London, which they ran as a finishing school for young ladies. While William Calder was in London enjoying his new life and new wife and business, back here in Polstead, matters were about to change rather drastically through dreams that were being received by Anne, the stepmother of Mariah, who claimed that she saw Mariah in her dreams inside the Red Barn and pointing to a spot on the ground where she believed Mariah had been murdered and buried. The dreams were so vivid, the dreams were so realistic that she compelled her husband, Thomas Martin, to go to the barn and he started the probe round in the ground with his mole spud and very quickly detected the remains of their daughter. 
and she had suffered a gunshot wound to the face. She'd been stabbed in the neck. She also had a green handkerchief around her neck, which was tied very tightly like a ligature, and she'd also been stabbed in the heart as well. In short, she had died a victim of a frenzied and sustained attack. Immediately, the coroner was contacted and an inquest was arranged at the nearby Cockin pub on the green at Polstead, and it's to there my story continues next. I'm standing outside the premises of the Cock Inn, which stands on the green in the centre of Polstead, which, following the discovery of Mariah Martin's remains, was used for an inquest into her death, although I hasten to add, history has changed somewhat. The building that you see behind you today was not the Cock Inn at this period of history. In fact, it is now a farmhouse which stands next door, as you can see here. But anyway, I digress. Her remains, such as they were, were identified by her sister Anne, and the appearance of a green handkerchief around her neck, which may have been used as a ligature, was also identified to be that to belong to Calder. Therefore, a warrant was issued for his arrest into this murder, and the local constable was then charged to find and locate him and bring him to book. And from there, my story continues onwards. Following the inquest, the village constable, uh, Mr Ayres, was dispatched to London to locate Corder and arrest him and bring him to book. And in that regard, he employed a London constable, a man by the name of James Lee, who became famous in later years for the Spring Hill Jack saga, which is another mysterious story of the unknown, which even today defies logical explanation. But I digress. It was easy to find Calder through an address that a friend had for him. And so they went to the house and they discovered Calder sat inside in the kitchen area, minuting an egg. And he appeared quite unconcerned by their presence. Once inside the property, he was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Mariah Martin and he was transferred back to Suffolk, to the town of Bury St Edmunds, where he was kept in prison at the Old Bury Jail and for which he appeared before the local court where he was charged on indictment with the following charges. Charge 1. Shooting her with a pistol inflicting a mortal wound in the left side of the face. Charge 2. Stabbing her with a sword on the left side of the body between the fifth and sixth ribs. Charge 3. By stabbing her with a sword on the right side of her face. Charge 4. By stabbing her on the right side of the neck. Charge 5. By putting and fastening a handkerchief about her neck and strangling her. Charge 6. By shooting her in the left side of the face. Charge 7. By throwing and pushing her into a hole dug in the floor of the barn and throwing a quantity of earth upon her, thereby suffocating her. Charge 8 by throwing her into a hole and burying her. Charge 9 by stabbing her in the left side and strangling her with a handkerchief conjointly. Charge 10 by all four wounds above mentioned and by strangling her with a handkerchief and by suffocating her with earth conjointly. Basically, because of forensic science in that period of history was still very much in its infancy, they really didn't know how she died. So in order to sustain a charge against him and obviously find for him as being guilty of the crime, they charged him with a number of possible charges, which some, of course, could be easily ruled out of court and others accepted, to ensure that he stood and was punished for the terrible crime that he was alleged to have committed by murdering Mariah Martin. And now we need to travel over to the town of Bury St Edmunds, where I intend to visit Moises Hall Museum, which has some spectacular exhibits very much connected to the William Corder trial.
Well, I've arrived in the town of Bury St Edmunds. In fact, I'm at Moises Hall Museum, where there are some interesting exhibits which were as a result of the infamous Corder trial. To be able to examine these exhibits in more detail, we need to go to a quiet back room at the side of the museum. Well, here we are in Bury St Edmunds and at the Moises Hall Museum where what is commonly known as the Calder Relics are housed. And uh, this is the town really most coast, closely associated with Calder. He was tried here and indeed executed here. And therefore there's this strong connection with the town. Um, the trial took place in August 1828. It was a fairly short trial. He actually, when still in the old jail at Bury St Edmunds, admitted committing the crime. And the execution was planned to, be, to take place a few days later outside the jail, outside the wall. And part of the punishment in those days uh, that the judge could award would be to have the body dissected after he was executed. Indeed, this is what happened and resulted in relics that can be seen in this museum today. Um, when Corder was executed, the body was conveyed to the Shire Hall in Bury St Edmunds and the chest was laid open by cutting the skin back and peeling it back to expose his muscles. And then the public filed past, looking, looking at the body thus exposed. Then the, the hospital in Bury St Edmunds, the West Suffolk Hospital, took the body and the body was then dissected by the surgeon, Mr Creed. And in fact, when he dissected the body, he tanned the scalp, which was preserved and is in this museum. He also tanned some of Corder's skin and had a copy of the trial bound in the skin, which again is in this museum. And of course, another thing we have from the execution is the death mask and the, and the bust that was made. These are very, very interesting relics and draw a lot of people to come to Bury St Edmunds just to see these relics. Okay, we have a number of exhibits on display pertaining to the court case and the murder itself, uh, some of which are fairly apocryphal. The first is Thomas Martin's mole spud, obviously fragmented today. Uh, and this is the tool of the trade for someone employed in finding out and killing moles. This was allegedly used in the process of the discovery of the body. And of course, as such, would have done damage to the corpse, which it's all part and parcel of the charges that end up being levelled at Corder himself. These are the two pistols that were produced at trial, Harcourt of Ipswich, and these almost certainly are, I have no question as to these being the actual pistols, because as you'll note, the hammers have been broken, which was done before being presented at trial. They also feature in an ownership argument after the trial, so there's good reason to suspect that these are exactly what they are. After anatomisation, the principal interest was in the preservation of the skull for the sake of the pseudoscience of phrenology. As a byproduct of that, you obviously have the re remaining skin at the disposal. Um, and what they chose to do in this instance is bind a book, Jay Curtis's book of the trial itself, which is this book here. Uh, and of course, this fragment is the remnants, the part they couldn't think of anything else to do with. This is the full bust made from the dead body of William Corder. So the important thing this shows us today is the process of execution pre someone like uh, Marwood. And this is uh, death really by strangulation and asphyxiation as opposed to a measured drop. And part of that process is illustrated with the lips and the nose, which quite often people ask us, is he of West African descent because of the shape? But that's the process of blood vessels bursting in his face and it wasn't a quick and painless death. This is the death mask of William Corder, and such this is a cast of a cast from a bust at Norwich Castle Museum. Uh, it's illustrative of exactly the same as the bust previously shown, although not so complete. Well, as you can see, uh, despite the years that have passed since the execution of William Corder, these exhibits from the trial are still here at Moises Hall Museum for people to come and see for themselves. I certainly make no judgment or comment upon the museum keeping these items because I personally think it's important for people to see 
how people were treated, and perhaps abominably, even though he was a murderer, at that period of history. Which actually brings me on to the next part of my chat here. Stuart is going to talk to you about crime and punishment. Well, I think the thing we have to realise uh, today is just how barbaric uh, the system of punishment was in the days of Corder. And in fact, uh, as we know, the executions were public, uh, probably about 7,000 people at his execution. It was almost a day's holiday for the family to go out and witness the execution of one of these miscreants. And, and the thinking, I believe, at the time was that uh, it set an example. And it, it, it was more than barbaric, it was actually cruel because they didn't have what later became known as the long drop which developed in the 1870s. In those days they had a very short drop, the platform would fall and the, the prisoner would hang, but he would be uh, subject to a drop of about two feet and, and it just didn't kill him. So he would strangle on the end of the rope which was a quite slow and painful way to die. And in fact, in Corder's case, it's alleged that the execution of Foxen actually added his own weight to Corder's by hanging on to his legs to make him die more quickly. So it's something we couldn't even contemplate today. And in fact, the last execution in this country was back in 1964, and, and they did it privately inside the prison then. And it was quick. It was a long drop. The neck was broken and the death was instant. And also they could uh, add to the punishment, such as in Corder's case, by ordering that the body be dissected. And not so long before that, they, they had public gibbets that the person would be exhibited, that he would be executed on a gallows. They would then erect a gibbet near to the scene of the crime and uh, make an iron cage to house the body. They would cover it in tar or pitch to preserve it. And then it would be hung from the gibbet for all to see as a, as a warning and they would sometimes remain there for years until it all fell apart and dropped to the ground and uh, such was the case uh, actually in Bury St Edmunds here just outside Bury we had a murder at Honington and the body was displayed in a gibbet cage which was actually dug up on the site of Honington airfield when it was built in the 30s and that the skeleton was still inside the gibbet cage and the cage is now on display in the museum here so we can see that this was a much more barbaric age and certainly the prisoner would pay for his sins uh, in a very, very painful way. Another uh, punishment that was meted out in those days was transportation to Australia. And nearly always murder would be a capital sentence, so the person would be executed. But in fact, they could also be transported, believe it or not, for murder if there were sort of mitigating circumstances surrounding the case. However, in Corder's case, there was absolutely no doubt that he committed the crime and it was seen that that was the way to deal with him. But it wasn't just murder that you could die for in these days. They would actually execute people for burglary, for theft. And in fact, Corder had already committed a capital offence before ever he killed Mariah Martin. He'd in fact stolen the cheque, the £5 cheque that Matthews had sent to Mariah and stealing the Royal Mail was an offence, a capital offence, for which he would have hanged anyway. Before we finish here today, Stuart took me on a wander around Polstead to a number of the locations which are mentioned in the story of William Corder and Mariah Martin, which will give you some idea today of what these places actually look like and where they are in relationship to the village itself. Well, OK, here we are virtually in the middle of Polstead Village. And the amazing thing is we know that if William Corder came back here today, he would still recognise it. And I mean, behind me here is the actual house that he lived in. This is the Corder family home, still known as Corder's house, and because they were quite big farmers in the area. Yes, and from Corder's house here, we can easily walk across to the church. So we'll, we'll just take a short walk now. Well, here we have the Church of St Mary's Polstead, the final resting place of poor Maria Martin. And of course, all the publicity that this case attracted. She was buried here in the churchyard. They erected a stone to her memory. But unfortunately, souvenir hunters chipped away at it until the end, nothing remained. So there's no sign of actually where the grave was, although there is a plaque erected very nearby to where she's buried, and that is still on display here.
And here is the only memorial to Mariah Martin, this wooden plaque on the shed wall. And then just across the way here, we have the site of the burial of most of the Corder family. Because across to the left here, you actually get another glimpse of Polstead Hall, which was the home of the Matthews family. And in this row here, you'll see most of the uh, headstones have the Corder name on it. This would appear to be his grandparents. And this looks to be his parents. The father died uh, uh, before the actual murder took place. And that's about it. We've got the Corder family resting very, very closely to where poor Maria is buried just across at the end of the church but a beautiful, peaceful spot. Because everywhere in this part of Polstead is so closely situated, it's very easy to walk down to the bottom here and just round the corner is Mariah's cottage. Up on the hill behind is the site of the barn and opposite her cottage is a high hill called Bell Hill, which actually gives a wonderful view of the whole village. Here we have the Martins cottage, this is where Mariah lived with her father, her stepmother and her other family and it's not very far at all from the Red Barn which is at the top of the hill behind the cottage. So you can see how this village is so compact and everything is on top of everything else. It's a very short walk and in those days of course people didn't stray very far from the village. Well here we're on Martins Lane and right here next to us is Mariah's cottage where she lived with her family. And to my right, Martins Lane goes off up the hill. And if you get to the top of the hill and look across the fields, you're at the site of the Red Barn. So she lived very, very close. And we'll now take a walk up to where the Red Barn was situated. Well, here we're trying to locate where the original Red Barn was, where Mariah Martin was murdered by William Corder. And as we step down here, looking to the left, I spot a red barn. Unfortunately, it's not the red barn. This is obviously, as you can see by its appearance, a modern barn. And the actual real red barn, barn that we're interested in was on the hill behind here. And what we're going to do is take a walk up here to see if we can pinpoint the exact spot that the red barn stood on. It was destroyed by fire in 1842 and unfortunately no trace of it now remains and it's always been very difficult to locate the exact spot but I think if you look through here by this gate you'll see quite a panorama of the field and to the right you can see a fence and somewhere near the top of the hill there by that fence is where the actual red barn stood and what a beautiful spot it is a beautiful deepest Suffolk Well here we find ourselves on the spot, or almost on the spot, where the Red Barn was located. But the big problem is, it's been gone so many years, it burned down in the early 1840s. There's no trace of it left, and all you've got is the old tithe map of this area to try and pinpoint where the barn was. It's still open fields, very unspoilt ground. And as far as we can tell from the map we've consulted, the barn would have stood just here somewhere behind me on the edge of this field and the next but of course the undergrowth has grown since that time and it was as we know from old sketches it was open to the uh, land to the west. Here we are on the east side of Polstead and the land was obviously farmed by the Corder family and it was the barn where Corder used to meet Mariah quite frequently we're led to believe but this is as near as we can get to the actual site of the red barn. Well that's the conclusion of my visit here today to Moises Hall. It's certainly been interesting and perhaps shocking to be able to look at some of the exhibits which have been here for so many years appertaining to William Corder's trial. I'm especially grateful to Alex 
and also to Stuart for their input on the trial of William Calder. And my story today isn't quite yet finished. There are a number of ghostly legends attached to William Calder, which I intend to go through now. I'm actually standing here inside the churchyard at Polstead, and along here are in fact members of the Calder family who are buried here. But what I want to touch on now actually concerns Calder himself. Events which have taken place since his death, strange stories and appearances and apparitions. And the first I wish to take you to, in fact, involves his former home at Calder's Farm. And it's to there that we need to walk to now, which in fact is all but a short walk back into the village, up from by the side of the village pond. I'm actually standing outside the Calder family home, which has been seen as a fine 15th century timber-framed oak property infilled with lava and plaster, which even today still stands prominent within the curtilage of properties inside the village. But one thing it's particularly noted for, allegedly, was certainly first observed in the mid-1920s and on Friday, May the 18th, which is the anniversary of Calder's murder of Mariah Martin, when a ghostly form is seen to glide from the property wearing a top hat and a frock coat which disappears eastwards. One can only assume that this may be William Calder perhaps hoping to reacquaint himself once more on this terrible anniversary with his victim Mariah Martin. Of course this is legend, there's no element of truth nor photographs to attest to it, but I for one would love to believe in this and to be able to witness his apparition leaving the property. My next part of my story concerning William Calder, and indeed the last part concerning his ghost, is actually partly concerned with his place of incarceration, which is the former prison, as you can see over the back. And this red brick wall, which in its day was probably three times higher than what it exists today, was the actual point where he was executed. So I'm actually standing by the execution scene, and where I'm actually standing here was an open green field, which was filled with between, according to records vary, between 7,000 and maybe 20,000 people who had arrived here on the day for the execution. Some 50 years after the execution of Corda, a local GP in Bury St Edmunds, a Dr Kilner, decided that he wanted Calder's skull as a memento as the skeleton was being displayed at West Suffolk Hospital and was being used for training purposes for the nursing staff there. Obviously having an association with the hospital, his presence there was obviously something which was not generally questioned. And so he decided that he would carry out his nephrous activity of exchanging the skulls with a spare that he had by going to the hospital around midnight. He worked under the candlelight and the three candles that he took with him were being snuffed out almost by an unseen force one after the other but he managed to keep the candles lit long enough for him to exchange the skulls. Once he took the skull home it was polished and put on display in an ebony case in his drawing room. And it was there that some strange occurrences started to affect his life and perhaps in a more significant manner than he would ever manage to believe. His general view of the paranormal was that after 50 years of doctors and nurses playing around with Corda's skeleton, the likelihood of any paranormal activity would have been knocked out of it. How wrong he was. 
A few days later, his servant called him at seven o'clock one evening. It was a winter's evening, it was dark and it was cold outside. And she said that a man was waiting to see him. He wanted to speak to the doctor directly. He asked who this man was and she described a man wearing a blue coat with silver buttons, which was in an old fashioned cut and wearing a beaver skin hat, which of course at that period of history was quite out of fashion. However, the doctor, quite unhappy about the fact that his leisure hours were being interrupted by this caller, went into the waiting room and noticed that he saw a shadow in the corner of the room from the candle that he had lit in his hand. He called for his servant to bring in a proper lamp and of course once the room was lit he discovered that there was nobody there, yet he felt certain that he could feel the presence of someone waiting in that room. He thought no more about it and a few days later he was sat in his drawing room looking out of the window into the garden when he saw standing by the summer house the very selfsame man dressed in a blue coat with silver buttons and wearing a beaver hat. He went to investigate who this intruder was but upon entering the garden discovered that this person had completely disappeared. By now, of course, Dr. Kilner, who was a complete skeptic being a man of science, had obviously started to reason with the fact that it may have been an unknown caller with regard to the skull, and perhaps it may also have been William Calder himself. He put such certain thoughts and notions to the back of his mind, but over the next few days he noticed, particularly at night, footsteps being heard in corridors, the sound of a muffled voice, and the reports of someone wailing and crying from down below in the drawing room. One evening he decided that he was going to confront this strange menace which he now believed may well have been William Calder who had revisited demanding the return of his skull. And so in the dead of night he lay in his bed with the bedroom door open to the landing and waited. Before long, he could hear movement outside. Was it on the landing or was it in the hallway? He listened more carefully, by which time he had placed himself into a tent made from his own bed clothes, and he was certain the noise was coming from down below. And so he lit a candle, held it over the banister, and saw below a hand covering a glass-faceted door handle, which led to the drawing room and the hand was white, but not attached to any body. This obviously disturbed the doctor, and so he stood there in wonderment as to what was going to happen next. The door opened and then it closed, and shortly afterwards there was a huge explosion which took place from down below. He rushed downstairs, opened the door, and discovered the skull sat there on its own, and the encased box absolutely shattered into a thousand fragments and lying across the floor and everywhere inside the room. He then resolved that he was going to get rid of the skull and decided the best place to return it to without drawing attention to the fact that he had actually stolen it from the hospital would be by taking it back here to Calder's place of execution at the Old Berry Jail and the actual prison house which is today is known as the fault, was occupied by a close friend who agreed to take the skull off his hands. But their matters were not to end. Shortly afterwards, the owner was beset by a string of terrible misfortunes which almost brought him to the brink of bankruptcy. He realised that this skull was nothing short of bad luck and needed to get rid of it. And so he decided to take it to one of many of Berry's churchyards where he paid a local grave digger to carry out the Christian ceremony and bury the skull somewhere in this churchyard, which today of course we have no knowledge of its exact location. But it is said that if anyone should be digging around in a churchyard around Berry's Edmonds and discover a Japan case containing a skull, they would be well cautioned to leave well alone. Shortly afterwards, all of the misfortunes which had beset this particular man had completely disappeared. And so there ends a sorry tale concerning the skull of William Calder. And there, of course, ends my documentary on the Red Bar murder. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation 
and I also hope that you will subscribe to future videos that will be presented on this channel. Until the next time. One of the nagging questions following the burial of Murrow Martin in the churchyard here at Polstead is in fact to where she is actually buried. Although at the time they erected a headstone in commemoration of that, it was unfortunate that due to the notoriety of the Corder trial, thousands of souvenir hunters have descended on the cemetery in years past and have chipped away at the headstone so it's completely disappeared. And the only point of reference that we have to where she may actually be buried is from a photograph taken in 1898 which shows a view from the side of the church tower looking out towards Polstead Hall towards the perimeter wall and towards a cluster of headstones. Unfortunately all those headstones have since disappeared but one actually remains. And so using this as a yardstick I need to draw a straight line running back towards the church wall and roughly from the photograph the small wooden cross which shows the alleged site of Moriah's grave would roughly be around here which in fact rather ironically is next to a drain so whoever put this drain in must have disturbed the remains of Moriah at some point anyway but this is where I think that Moriah is actually buried of course we're not going to be able to verify that short of taking bones for DNA and then of course you've got to find living relatives to compare with. But I'm fairly sure Mariah is here and I certainly hope that her remains lay in situ here for the remainder of time so that she may in fact now find peace.